Hey, I'm Tamara Kendacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. So last week, prosecutors in Rwanda asked the court to sentence Paul Rusesa Begina to life in prison for terrorism charges. Now, if you don't recognize that name, you might remember him as the main character in the 2004 movie Hotel Rwanda. This is the man who took over the hotel in the capital, Kigali, and sheltered 1,200 Tutsis from the Hutu militia that killed hundreds of thousands of people in 100 days. Human rights organizations say Rusesa Begina was kidnapped by the Rwandan government and then brought to the country for a show trial. Since the genocide, Rwanda's done a lot of work to rehabilitate its image under the very long run of President Paul Kagame. Ever since 1994, the official narrative and the narrative of the world has largely accepted, uh, and Western leaders have largely accepted, is that Paul Kagame is the hero of the genocide. That's Jeffrey York, The Globe's Africa correspondent. Today on The Decibel, Jeffrey takes us through how the treatment of Rusesa Begina and other dissidents calls into question the narrative that's been created around Rwanda and what the reality actually looks like. Let's get into it. Jeffrey, hi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So Paul Rusesa Begina is the man played by Don Cheadle in the Hollywood movie Hotel Rwanda. He's currently sitting in a Rwandan jail facing charges of terrorism. Tell me how he ended up there. Well, it's interesting. You know, when that movie first came out, Paul Kagame, the president, attended the premiere of the movie in Kigali and indicated no problems with it. He seemed very happy with it. But shortly after that movie was released... Mr. Rusesa Begina released his autobiography and was quite critical of the Kagame regime. Mm -hmm. And that was when it all started to go downhill for him. He he is somebody who has been very critical over the years of the Kagame government. And it's very clear that the Rwandan regime does not want critics of Mr. Kagame to be regarded as heroes of the genocide. So he was accused of falsifying his story, of not being a hero at all. His whole version of that was in the movie was widely attacked in the mm-hmm. state media in Rwanda. And finally, what happened last year is uh, he was lured to Dubai on the pretext that he would be connecting to a flight that would take him to Burundi to speak at a church event. In fact, he was tricked. He was put onto a private airplane in Dubai that had been paid for by the Rwanda government, as the government later acknowledged. And he was flown against his will to Rwanda, where he was immediately arrested, of course, and put in solitary confinement for several days and charged with terrorism. The Human Rights Watch has called it an enforced disappearance, which is contrary to international law. But he is still on trial Without getting into the question of the evidence for and against those charges of terrorism, which basically are about how much support did he give, if any, to armed militia groups in Congo, what is clear from the trial is that it's not following international judicial norms. He is not allowed to talk freely to his lawyers. He's not allowed to talk to international lawyers that he has hired. His communications with his lawyers have been intercepted. And I don't think anybody's in doubt about the outcome. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that uh, he is going to be convicted. Right. And and Paul Rusesa Begina isn't the only person who's allegedly faced consequences for challenging the official version of history in Rwanda. Can you tell me about some of the others and, and what happened to them? Well, there's been dozens and dozens of cases of opponents of the government either being imprisoned, killed, exiled, arrested, harassed, and so on. Last year, there was a case involving a gospel singer named Kazito Mahigo. Now, he was uh, an incredibly popular musician in Rwanda. And then one day, he recorded a song in which he, he called for mourning for the victims of the genocide. But he also called for mourning and compassion for victims of revenge killings. In other words, the Hutus who had been killed by the Rwandan army and so on during the course of the genocide or afterwards. 
And that is something that the Rwandan regime does not tolerate. So he was immediately arrested, placed in prison. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was forced to apologize. He was eventually released after his apology and so on. But then he tried to leave the country. He was arrested again. And then he mysteriously died in police custody. So what kind of evidence is there linking the deaths of at least some of these dissidents with people in the Rwandan government? In South Africa, I mean, I've talked to at least two of the people who were hired to kill Rwandan dissidents in South Africa. And we documented this in the Globe and Mail in a story a few years ago. There was uh, audio recordings that we obtained in which the head of Rwandan intelligence tried to organize assassination plots to kill the two leading dissidents in South Africa, Patrick Karagea and uh, General Niamwasa. Mm -hmm. Those two people were subjected to attacks for a number of years. And as we know, finally, on New Year's Eve 2013, Patrick Karagea was strangled to death in his room in a luxury hotel in Johannesburg. The, the other leader of the Rwandan National Congress, the opposition group, General Niamwasa, General Kiyumba Niamwasa, was himself subjected to a number of attacks over the years. And as I say, we have recordings that showed how the Rwandan head of intelligence was organizing people to, to go after those uh, two dissidents. And uh, mm -hmm. I myself have interviewed two of the people who were hired in those assassination plots. And, and what is the official version of history in Rwanda that Kagame wants to preserve? And what about it do Rusasa Bagina and, and other dissidents challenge? Well, I think, you know, the world has a, a natural tendency to look for heroes and villains in history. And ever since 1994, the official narrative and the narrative of the world has largely accepted uh, and Western leaders have largely accepted, is that Paul Kagame is the hero of the genocide. He was the one that stopped the genocide. Now, of course, the reality is much more complicated than that. And the problem is, if you challenge that narrative, it's actually a criminal offense in Rwanda. You'll be called a genocide denier, a revisionist, and so on, and you can be imprisoned for up to 10 years. So that narrative is not often challenged. And even in the diaspora, it's difficult for people to challenge that. And even uh, scholars and journalists, there's a, a lot of surveillance and harassment. Of course, the Tutsis were the victims of the genocide, and, and nobody is denying that. But what is often forgotten is that there was also Hutu victims. There was a UN report that was never publicly released, but was done uh, within months of the genocide that found that an estimated 30,000 people had been killed by the RPF in a systematic, organized manner. So that was basically evidence of war crimes. And that's the part that leads to a lot of tension, really, because the Hutus within Rwanda and in the diaspora feel that there was no justice for them. This is causing a lot of tension internationally. In 2018, through pressure by the Kagame government, the UN officially changed the designation of the genocide, you know, which has often had been called the genocide in Rwanda or the Rwanda genocide, changed the name so it was called the genocide against the Tutsi. And only two governments, the US government and the UK government, have objected to that. And they point out that if you do that, you're basically erasing the Hutu victims from history. Why is it so important for Kagame to have an official version of history? And I know that there's two, probably two different answers to this. So what does his government say and what do his critics say? Well, you know, you look at the fact that he has been in power for 27 years. Uh, the first few years he was in power, he wasn't the president, he was the defense minister, but everyone knew he was running the country. He also has changed the constitution so that he can rule for another 13 years, which would give him a total of 40 years in power. And in every election, he is re-elected with more than 90% of the vote. So that in the last election in 2017, he had 99% of the vote. Now, if you have that kind of record mm -hmm. of constantly maintaining power, never allowing any opposition, then you need a way to legitimize that. You need a way 
to tell the world, don't worry, it's not a fair system. I'm always getting reelected, but don't worry, I'm a good guy. So the main reason that he tells the world that he's a good guy is because of the events of 1994, where he is portrayed as the man who stopped the genocide. That's a big, big part of his legitimacy. He doesn't have democratic legitimacy because nobody really believes those elections, uh, especially when the, his opponents have been either disqualified or arrested or jailed or, or whatever. Right. I think a lot of people, at least here in Canada and in the U.S., think of Rwanda as a success story now. So many people um, do credit Paul Kagame with ending the genocide. The country is called a model for truth and reconciliation after conflict. I've heard about Rwanda's high proportion of female politicians. It's a tourism destination. How do we square that with this political violence that we're, we've been talking about? There's many governments that are heavy donors to Rwanda, to the Rwanda government, including Canada. This kind of uh, mythology about it being a, a model for the world is often used to justify these hundreds of millions of dollars in annual donations that many governments are giving to Rwanda. For example, yeah, it's often said that a large number of MPs in Rwanda are, are female. But the problem is they have no power. It's a, basically a one-person dictatorship. The idea of truth and reconciliation, this is based on the idea that uh, you know, Paul Kagame has eliminated the use of the terms Hutu and Tutsi, that there's no more ethnic identification. But that's also a bit of a myth, because if you talk to Rwandans, they all are very aware of their ethnic identity. Of course, everyone knows that uh, the Rwanda government is dominated by the Tutsi. There may be some token appointments here and there, but it's basically run by the Tutsi. So it's hard to talk about truth and reconciliation when there's been justice, really, for only one ethnic group in Rwanda. It's true that he has a lot of popularity because, of course, he controls the state media. He controls every aspect of uh, the government and the security apparatus. It's natural that people would support their leader. But on the other hand, we don't really know what a free and fair election would produce because there's never been one. Now, the problem is in the international community, he is seen as the person who is you know, sort of bringing Rwanda out of poverty, generating economic growth, and so on. But you know, when you look more closely at the statistics, and there's been some recent studies about this, in fact, the official statistics on reducing poverty, producing economic growth, and so on, have been very seriously questioned by some very strong independent studies. And it seems that you know, there's pretty good evidence that the reduction of poverty has not been nearly as much as the government has claimed and as uh, f external donors have claimed. So, you know, there's a lot of question marks about whether he has achieved as much as the international community likes to tell us, really. What is Canada's response to the arrest of Paul Rusesabagina and to the political assassinations in, in Rwanda and abroad that people say that the Kagame government is responsible for? Yeah, the Canadian government has been very quiet about all of that. Uh, I have asked them what their position is on the trial of Paul Rousseau-Sabagina, and they have said simply that they think he'll be provided a fair and transparent legal process by the relevant authorities. Uh, so that's saying that they uh, basically trust the system in Rwanda. You know, a few other, uh, well, human rights groups and so on have been very critical and uh, ha have questioned whether there is an independent justice system in Rwanda that can be uh, relied upon to give a fair verdict in a case like this. So Canada's been very quiet. And I think this is part of a, a larger pattern. Canada, over, over the years, since 1994, has provided more than $500 million in development aid to Rwanda. So to a large extent, Prime Minister Trudeau has hitched himself to the Kagame government. And now, if you look at the reasons for that, I think the main reason that it's easy for the government to do that, the Canadian government, is that in Canada, we only have a vague notion of Rwandan history. And that notion was very much cemented into place in 1994 and 1995, when the narrative of, you know, from the mainstream media in Canada and internationally was that the Kagame government and the military, uh, the RPF, was basically ending the genocide. That Once that narrative mm -hmm. cements itself into place, then Canada, like most other countries, has this very much this view of good guys and bad guys. And uh, as long as Paul Kagame continues to be seen as a good guy, then Western governments are not really talking about the evidence of war crimes, 
the assassinations, the human rights abuses, all the evidence that Rwanda is very much almost a totalitarian state. Why do you think that was? Why was there so little reporting by the many journalists covering Rwanda about the other side of this? You know, there was a recent book by the British author Michaela Rong. The book is called Do Not Disturb, which is a reference to the hotel room where Patrick Karagea was killed on New Year's Eve 2013. But it's also a reference to the Western world's, the Western government's attitude towards Rwanda, which is also do not disturb. And uh, she looked at how that narrative came into place in 1994. And uh, a lot of journalists that she talked to who covered the initial period of the genocide uh, said that they were basically traveling with the RPF. They were dependent on the RPF for translation, for transportation, and so on. So they were taken to killings that the RPF wanted to show them, and they were not taken, they were not shown other killings that were done by the RPF itself. So uh, that's that was you know partly just a result of kind of the logistics of uh, how the media were able to cover it. There wasn't much media coverage at all in the beginning days. I mean, you have to remember that uh, 1994 was the year when um, – Nelson Mandela became the first democratic president of South Africa. Most of the media were covering the election in South Africa. They were not covering the genocide. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I guess, present one quote to you from this 1994 human rights interview with uh, a policymaker in the U.S. And they said, we have three choices. Support the former genocidal government. That is impossible. Support RPF, that is possible. Support neither. That is unacceptable because it might result in those responsible for the genocide coming back to win. Do you think that is part of the calculation? Like, do we not want to destabilize Rwanda because maybe Kagame has been good for Rwanda? Yeah, I think you're right, especially in the initial years after the genocide. There was an international concern that the Hutu government, which uh, the Hutu, you know, the People who perpetuated the genocide had fled to Congo, and they could come back and fight again or, or try to take over the country again. So there was international concern about that, and the feeling was the only way to stabilize Rwanda in those early years was to support Paul Kagame. But what's happened is that uh, initial decision has sort of frozen into concrete and has become a, a forever decision. And today, you know, 27 years later, we still have the same policies that were determined in those early months and years after the genocide. Mm. You know, in 2010, a Hutu politician named Victoire Ingabir came back and decided to run for president. And she said that one of the things she wanted to do was to bring justice to those who had not yet received justice, which is the Hutu victims. And she was almost immediately placed in jail for many years. So the message is from the Kagame government is that the Hutus are effectively powerless. They cannot have a legitimate campaign for president. They cannot talk about their grievances. Uh, and that, you know, according to a lot of analysts, is actually creating a dangerous situation where the government seems very stable, but there is a large, large proportion of the population that is quite unhappy, that feels aggrieved, that feels that it never had justice, and that that actually creates an unstable situation. So, you know, the argument uh, that uh, a dictatorship is more stable than a democracy, you know, internationally has often been proven wrong. Mm. And uh, so the idea that one authoritarian is the world's only hope of preventing bloodshed in Rwanda, I think is just increasingly known to be false. That's it for today. I'm Tamara Kendacker. Our producers are Madeline White and Kasia Mihailovic. David Crosby edits the show. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much to Jeffrey York. You can find Jeffrey on Twitter or at theglobalmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.